Murakoze cyane Uh, Your Excellency, our Ambassador, Matilda, distinguished dignitaries here present, friends of Rwanda, our dear leaders, our spiritual leaders in your various uh, capacities, friends of Rwanda, Bavandimwe, sisters and brothers of the Rwandan diaspora, Amakuru Muraho. I'm so very delighted and honored and humbled to be here with you. I know it's late, and I know I believe some of you come from far, but I hope you will bear with me because I've been looking forward to sharing with you what I have in mind. I was last here three years ago, and I'm so delighted to be back, and I want to thank you for your presence. I also want to thank the ambassador and your team here, Antoinette and your team, for all the work that you do to organize such events. I know how demanding your lives are. I've been in that diaspora for the last seven years. I knew how I was when I was busy as mayor, but you also have challenges uh, living in the global world and trying to fight and be competitive and still remain connected with your home uh, country, Rwanda. So we're very, very grateful for that. Um, I bring warm greetings from Her Excellency, our First Lady, Madame Jeanette Kagami. She uh, most sincerely requested me to convey warm greetings to you and also a note of appreciation for your continued commitment to strengthening the unity and development of Rwanda and its people. She's very proud of you. She couldn't be here with us, although she was with us for the, for the prayer breakfast, but because of other uh, very urgent commitments, she had to leave, so she asked me to convey her regards to you. Now, um, I wanted, I've been listening to what was shared before, and thank you very much, both bishops, uh, Mujisha, and uh, Darlington, and uh, Reverend is it Bishop Weaver, who prayed for us. I think you laid the foundation for every one of us who is a Christian to search in our hearts and minds and ask ourselves, what is it that the Lord means when he says that he'll give us the strength to, to, to rise up like egos and, and stay connected with him? Especially for those of us, or for those of you who are here, who have had many more opportunities to serve, but also more importantly, to be exposed to knowledge, to resources, to things that the world is searching for. How do we connect the two? And for that uh, matter, I want to say that the day before yesterday when the ambassador was addressing the African team that had come for the National Prayer Breakfast here, who are with congressmen and women, she mentioned something that I found very interesting. It's in our culture. And she quoted the, the Umugani uh, Bawitichi. The proverb that, that's like the hole, the little hole that, uh, that weeds or that nurtures uh, relationships, friendship, and unity is the foot, the feet. And the feet, it was in the sense that where people used to walk or to travel to visit one another. I think... What we are seeing these days is that even when we are close together, we are getting more and more disconnected. Yeah. You really have to be so intentional to, ser to, to, to set time aside for your family, for your children, for your spouse. You have to set time aside because all these things have diverted us. It becomes a lot much more complicated when you serve a higher office and now when you're away from home. I'm sure for the Ronans in the diaspora, I've been there. It was so hard for me even to connect with my own parents when my mom was still uh, alive. And I can imagine that we all yearn for that. So what do we do to remain connected in a fast-changing world as God continues to give us the opportunity to serve a country as beautiful as Rwanda? 
So I thought I wanted to share with you in that context, building on the opportunity we had from the national prayer breakfast that we had back at home, and thanks Eric and your team for organizing that, where we were reminded by our president of two things. And I want us to, I was trying to look for a way I could connect with what the previous speaker said, because I wear two hats. I'm a Christian and born again. And at the same time, I have had the opportunity of serving in my home country. If you met me 30 years ago, 25 years ago, and you said, I prophesy, Chirabo, you're going to be a member of parliament, I mean, I would really have laughed at you, because it never crossed my mind. I was not even keen on it. I'm a veterinarian, my profession, I loved my profession, I loved my farmers, we loved our cows, and the cow story was enough for me. <laughs> but here comes, and I want us to step back and ask ourselves, what has Rwanda provided to us? And how are we utilizing it? And in my humble uh, appeal to you, please take note, I'm not a perfect example here coming to brag. I have been a student, I have succeeded, I have failed sometimes, I have faltered, I go, I learn as I go. But there are some things I have reflected on that I wanted just to share with you. In a journey where leadership is inclusive and calls upon Rwandans dignified to have a stake in making a difference in our home country and now on the continent. <laughs> and what is this? He asked us, during that national prayer breakfast, because we had seen the statistics on the issue of malnutrition. You have heard about that. I'm sure you've read the reports, how almost 40% of our children are malnourished. Do we want to see when Christ comes? You know, I want to imagine these egos, you know, moving towards Christ with a malnutrition level as much as that. So how do we connect what we have as a vision to what we are faced with today? And that is not to overwhelm us or challenge us to get desperate, but I think it's to wake, up, to wake us up to the realities of where we stand today. And I thought about three things. The first one is the necessity for us to build the character of leadership that will be able to rise above the storm, as the, uh, Bishop Mujisha talked about. And in the character of leadership, when I remember what happened to me as the Constitution opened the big door for women to be voted into Parliament, and that's how I left my vet profession to Parliament. But wait, I didn't have the skill set that was necessary for me to engage in policy debate, to speak as I'm speaking now. There was so much to learn, and yet, as a human being, I had my fears, and with that also, I had my pride. Uh, you just couldn't, you know, bump into me and tell me about my weakness and, that, and, and try to challenge me or teach me. I think there we begin with the issue of the character of leadership that calls us to be people of integrity and people especially of humility. So I went around to, to search really because I saw um, and learned that... Um, Many people, even when you are well-intentioned, you don't necessarily perform as well because there's so much to learn. And when you make mistakes, it's not very easy to rise up again. And one of the key elements, I think, that comes out very clear, both from the Christian background and also from leadership, is humility. And therefore, uh, I was inspired very much by what David says because David fell short of God's glory in a very like really drastic manner. When you compare David and Saul, I mean, David killed. David committed the sin of adultery and he killed. But David was forgiven. Saul just disobeyed and Saul was cursed. Why? Because when Saul was, when, when, when God sent the messenger to Saul to tell him you are no longer the ego that you are meant to be, Saul defended himself. He couldn't, his pride couldn't let him accept defeat or fault and give himself a chance to learn. 
But we see in Psalm 51, when you, are, when you have an example, when, David, when Nathan came to tell David what he had planned in his eagerness, I mean, when he was on, uh, when, as, as his country went to war, he was on top of a, of a building looking at his city, and he sees this naked woman and, you know, goes for him and schemes and finally kills the husband. David got it, and he fell down and genuinely, deeply repented. Now, I want to take it that this is the characteristic of a true leader. Who knows that it is human? I'm not saying we should go and fall. Rather, we should, we should commit mistakes. But we should be humble enough to accept the truth and to allow ourselves to heal and move on. And so, I'll give you... Quickly, just to relate it to something very practical. As I told you, I'm a vet. Uh, three years down the line, I'm in Parliament. I'm landing at a supersonic speed. Uh, I'm being challenged. I'm you know, trying my best. But I'm also getting more keen and realizing the impact of policy on people's lives. So three years down the line, I am very clear that the, par the cities and towns are so critical in the lives of the farmers. However hard we work, as long as our markets are not working, there is a problem. So I get this opportunity. I vie for the seat of being mayor. I become a mayor, but my goodness, I'm so ill-equipped to lead a city because it's a cocktail. It's everything. It's so huge. I went in with passion. I went in with a full commitment. I, church was praying for me, but two weeks after, church was just wondering, what's going on with Chilabu? I remember, I was told later on that they were thinking I was demon-possessed. <laughs> and this is a very similar, why, why, why were they thinking I was demon-possessed? Because some of the churches that were constructing churches in the swampy areas, where we're not supposed to build, I went and closed them off. So I, I, I mean, I talked to them, but this is not going to work. They said, no, 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 let's pray about this. They said, no, we cannot pray about a fact. This is clear. It is against the law. It's against the environment. It is disastrous. We are dealing with it. So, now, my, you can imagine that my constituency is disappearing, and I don't know where I'm heading. So, uh, what I wanted to say is that I fully do agree with what Weaver said. But if we are going to lead a people, a country, and other nations to development, the Lord will give us the strength, but we have to have the will too. I really believe that there are so many things God can do within us, which we limit by ourselves. Sometimes we, feel, we, we want to feel safe enough, secure enough to get out of our comfort zone. But I want to encourage each one of us to search themselves. How do we stay connected in all that? Of course, the number of mistakes I made, and I will remind, I'll just mention two quickly. One was depending on information that I would get from my technocrats and those who were around me. Because the city is moving very fast. You can only know the truth if you get yourself out of the bureaucracy, walk, or go and try to be close to the lives of ordinary people. I have a land cruiser, I have a phone, I have everything. So how do I know when people don't have transport? How do I know when beyond the main road, when the sidewalks have got like, uh, you know, holes in them where people fall? It meant I had to do tours and I had to humble myself and go and sit with the people and talk to them. I had a master plan that I was, I mean, it's not me who established it, but it's, it, we, we invested in it and it was in, uh, uh, enacted. But was it practical? Was it going to empower the ordinary woman who is selling bananas on the road? We had to sit with them and think of projects. I want again to commend the leadership that we have back at home because one person who taught me to get out of rhetoric and bureaucracy was our president. He would call me, put me in his vehicle, call the ministers, call the army police. We are going to tour the city to find out how public lighting is to find out in the evening where people are, uh, are, are waiting for their transport. Do they get transport? How are they, uh, what is life like? 
what is the cost of beans and, 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 uh, and sugar these days? And it's like, wait a minute, How, what is this? So you understand what I'm trying to say? So that awakened me that leadership is not about comfort. It is not about just statistics. It is stepping in the shoes, especially of those. So the natural answer in me at first was like, when he would ask me, said, honestly, I would fear, of course, telling him that. But the truth was, in my mind, I was saying, but I work very hard from morning to evening. What else could I do? But he is the head of state. He puts aside everything to mentor me. So how else could I do it apart from me after leaving his vehicle to also call my mayors, the city council, my, like the, 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 the ambassador brought her team here. I had to learn to bring my team and would go through the same tour and then we made a system of that. That made us, got us closer to people. Seven years down the line, I've been in the UN. I've been working with UN Habitat for the last seven years. I can tell you that one of the biggest challenges cities and towns have is inequalities. You have got abject poverty seated next to extreme affluence. It is totally unacceptable. How do we as leaders address that? Except if we humble ourselves and look beyond our own comfort zone. How relevant is that to you here in the diaspora. I do believe it is, and I want to thank you so much because I was listening to Omushi Chirano. Uh, I was away out of the country, but I managed to follow. And it was so good to hear people from, from the diaspora all coming up with proposals on how to deal with the different issues that we have back at home. But I believe that beyond that, we can ask ourselves, what is it that is happening in my home Mudugudu? Because you all come from somewhere. We need to localize we need to localize and, and concretely focus on some key elements that we can address. Mujisha talked about his and uh, the others did, and I really am so happy and grateful, and I'm sure you all are doing something about it. But what I've seen, which we have had back at home, which we can exploit and you can exploit as, as the diaspora, is that there is clarity of vision, purpose, and, and uh, a plan of action that comes from the national level to the local level. You don't have to go beating about the bush. When I stepped into the UN, they were talking about the Millennium Development Goals and we went into Sustainable Development Goals. We didn't call that in Rwanda, but we had, it, we had Imihigo. And Imihigo is exactly that. So what we need to do now is to sit and say, what is it that we could contribute to Mihigo? Whether you want to separate, you do it at Murenje level or district level, it doesn't matter. You don't have to do everything. But what is it, one or two things that we can commit to and say, we're going to invest in this in the next two, three, four years, and we want results. We want statistics. We want to see the change that is expected to take place. I think that is the beauty of Rwanda. So when I stepped out, the third point, when I stepped out into the international arena, it was easier for me to go with those lessons, to know that I can only be as good as the least amongst those that I serve. Christ had made it very clear. Christ said, whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. And it's only, it's that litmus test that will test who we are as Christians. I found myself sometimes struggling because when you see what we say and where we are as Christians in, in positions of leadership, we still have a gap. And I do believe that I think with better planning, better collaboration, and better coordination and focus, we can get there. Um, I had a lot more to say, but I don't think I want to take too long. I think the last point I want to talk about is connecting with those that we serve, but most importantly, connecting with our families. This country hosts a lot of our children. Many people really spend almost everything they have to send their children to school, including myself and my husband. It's a land of opportunity. It's a land of great knowledge and skills and expertise. We really appreciate it. But it's so, so important that we follow up on them because we are irreplaceable as parents. They may go to the best of universities. They may go to the best of colleges, but nobody will exchange, will step in 
your position as mother or father. My, again, humble experience in my haste, of wit, something I never imagined, in my haste at work, just to give you an example, because I was so close to my parents, and whenever I, like even when I became a Christian, my prayer has always been that my children come to see God in me, and that, you know, I give them the best that I could. But the busier I got, the harder it became. So when I would come from office, and, uh, you know, my children would come, I, I wouldn't even see that, but I wouldn't be able to listen. So this, my, our first born comes in and says, Mom, can I, and I'm, yes, what exactly do you want to talk about? And she starts, okay, I understand, can you please go, uh, you know, write it down and then come. She said, Mom, can you please tell the mayor that I want to speak to my mom? <laughs> you see? And I'm like, it was profound. I took a step back. I felt so embarrassed. I was so grateful to her that she was honest. I thanked her. I hugged her. And since that time, I made a resolution. Every six months, I sit with them and I ask them, you are my best advisors. Tell me areas that you think I could improve on. And I can tell you, more than three times, it's been, Mom, listen more. Mom, listen. And Mom, you seem to have answers for everything. <laughs> the younger one told me, Mom, can you, when I come and I'm pissed off, this is, I think, the American language, eh? can you give me space and time to be pissed off? <laughs> and I don't know how to do that because I feel I want to fix it. I, I, if you tell me you have a problem, I feel it's my role to get a, a response. No. The child at that time maybe just wants you to be there, to feel for them, give them the space as they search, and then you pray for them. So it's my hope and desire, and I really pray that as parents, because I know there is alcoholism, there are so many things that are taking place. And many times we get into the judgment seat so quickly. But we need to sit on the seat of love and ask ourselves, before they went to alcoholism and those, where were we? What has taken our position? Because you are irreplaceable. So I pray and hope that we as parents really take time to cater and to care and to listen and to respect and value our children and then value our spouses, yes, we are mature people. We can fight for space and the rest of it. But I think the most vulnerable are our children. And they are great blessing from God. We are here where we are because our mothers, even in times of crisis, were very dignified women who brought up, most of them brought up their families as single mothers, as widows. We know what happened. But they never disgraced themselves in front of the children. They fell on their knees. They worked very hard and told the children the character that we see in them, in our leaders today. So I'm calling upon <laughs> colleagues. I'm calling upon sisters, mothers. Let's take that step. And let's go beyond our children and reach out to the children of Rwanda, especially those that don't have parents. You know that now we've gone into the time of remembrance, and there are many who don't have anybody to call mom. And I'm sure one way or another, in your own way, you can step in there and make a difference. May our Lord God help us to live as Christ expects us to. God bless you abundantly.